Well, our next speaker is Dr. Paul Mitchell. He's an associate professor uh, in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics. Um, he's going to talk about meta economics of cover crops, and he's told me that this will be the best economics talk you'll hear all week. So please help me welcome Paul Mitchell. All right, thank you. Um, first off, I want to talk about what am I actually going to talk about. And the economics of cover crops, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through bu budgets and stuff like that. You've all heard a lot of talks here um, about different benefits and stuff. And you can, you, you, what is the cost? That's the next step. And that, we'll get to that. I'm not going to spend time talking about that. I'm going to put some dollar value estimates to some of the benefits. Um, we'll, I'll show you some numbers here in a bit. Um, but what the heck's this meta-economics thing? Um, it's the economics of the economics of cover crops. I'm going to try to do the, a broader, deeper, some of the principles that are driving what we see out there on what are farmers really doing. These are some quick benefits, and I'm going to talk about the first three. Um, reduced soil erosion, nutrient capture and release for crop use, additional forage. I'm not going to talk about suppression of the different um, uh, pathogens and pests and such. I'm not going to really talk about improved soil health. Um, so the first one is, what is the value of a ton of soil? That, that's, this has been an issue. And um, suppose you prevented some soil erosion. What's it worth? What's it actually get you? Um, Jim Hansen and Mark Rabaudo are um, ag economists at USDA Economic Research Service. And in 2008, they came out with this technical bulletin. And you can actually go in and look up each county, and it has a number. What they've done is they did a big lit review and um, pulled together a lot of stuff, all the different impacts that um, soil erosion has on society and come up with a dollar impact. Um, if you prevented a, a ton of soil, how much would you benefit would you generate? Or conversely, if you had an extra e ton of erosion, how much damage would you cause? And they kind of, what this, I mean, they did their best, but they kind of called it a lower bound on the value of a ton of soil, either saved or eroded, whichever way you want to look at it. In Wisconsin, I've highlighted the two that really are big generators, recreational fishing and water-based recreation. Other parts of the country, other benefits are a big deal. Um, this is the map of what they come up with. Um, these are at the county level, and they were meant for like NRCS to do their policy analysis and um, guide um, erosion um, control um, um, spending. Benefit Wisconsin is somewhere between eight, 881 to 657 a ton. It would be a ton of soil. Per, um, of that productivity, or of that benefit, about a buck 21 is soil productivity. You know, if you're eroding your soil, there goes some of your value of your land. That's the next year's yield, potentially. Um, you can see how it falls out across the U.S. We're up there, you know, we're in the five to nine dollar region. Um, there's some greater than nine dollars up there in the Northeast, and you can see the wind erosion and such. Um, they're fairly constant across our Wisconsin counties. So what I thought is, okay, what can so what can a cover crop do? Let's look at that farmer cost. We're not going to farmers aren't going to be worried about, we'll say, in a very self-centered pr perspective about what the erosion of soil does downstream. Just going to work on what does it mean? There's this dollar twenty-one a ton benefit. Um, of soil productivity being washed away. That's in $1990 is the way they did it in their study because they went back for whatever reason they picked that year. So we'll convert that to current dollars. Um, you take it times 1.79 using the consumer price index. That's 217 um, a ton. How much do we have in Wisconsin? The state average is roughly 4.6 tons. There was an article in the newspaper this weekend had it at 4.4. So somewhere around that is the average annual erosion of soil from Wisconsin land. Um, We'll take $2.17 or $2.17 a ton times 4.6 tons per acre. Almost $10 an acre is lost in productivity, is the idea, um, every year. This is the average across all the land. Um, and it also puts an upper bound. So if a, if a cover crop came in and he completely limited soil erosion, the loss in productivity it would be stopping would be about 10 bucks an acre. It'd be a quick, simple guess. So that's an upper bound on what you could get if you stop soil erosion for on average, this isn't a specific field, this is the average field. So we'll talk about soil erosion, not a ton there, or not a lot there, um, you know, maybe 10 bucks an acre if it really did a lot. And that's just the farmer stuff, not the downstream cost, not the stuff like Tom was talking about on le going downstream and stuff like that, just the individual personal cost. Let's look at nitrogen. Um, how much nitrogen do cover crops immobilize for the following crops? There's a really nice study out of, um, out of Spain. It's a five-year study, and the reason I pick it is for these pictures, the graphs here. Um, I haven't found graphs like this. They did a cover cropping study in Spain, but it's before corn or maize, as they call it, um, and they come up with these probability um, density functions. It's very skewed, and this is the part I really want to push. 
there's a lot of times, there's a lot of low to medium values, but then there's this chance once in a while some really big nitrogen captures. Um, you know, it depends how big the crop is and just the way the conditions work out. And you can just see that in the data. The average, these are all kilograms per hectare, so like 82 kilo, like 74, 75 pounds of nitrogen per acre is the average. But the mode is 12, like 10, 11 um, pounds. Um, but, and you can see there, but sometimes it's really high. Same thing, and this is a barley cover crop, you get same, something similar, an average of what, little over, upper 50s pounds per acre, but the mode is 22 kilograms, so 20 pounds per acre of nitrogen. So, you know, the point I'm gonna make is it's, it's variable and there are some chances from really high outcomes. Um, then just because it mo immobilizes it doesn't mean you're gonna, the following crop gets it. It depends on so many things, and you all know, you've heard several talks about some of that, how did you terminate it? What's the soil temperature when you terminate it? What's the moisture? What's the timing relative to the major uptake period of the following crop? Cover crop species, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a ton of stuff in there. Um, and so I just use this paper again because it had some nice numbers. It's the average uptake rate by, by, for corn um, was 90% of the barley nitrogen was captured. That's the average. There's going to be another distribution around it. 81% for veg, 65% for rapeseed. I don't know what we have for Wisconsin crops or Midwestern crops and, you know, and uh, these are different, these are just an example of what you can get. And then you've, I'm sure some of you have seen this and other, or know this, you know, some cover crops actually consume nitrogen as they decompose. They're, they're, it depends on the ratios of the carbon and nitrogen and such. Um, Matt Ruark and Jim Studi have a little, pay, you Google that cover crop considerations for 2012, you'll get it. Um, this is what we have here in Wisconsin. Um, this is UW Extension, Matt Ruark and Jim Studi, night when Jim was working for UW Extension. Um, nutrient credits vary by cover crop species, by size, planting date. That table 9.5 there shows you um, less than six inches of growth, ver growth versus more than six inches of growth. Um, you know, alfalfa, different, um, couple different clovers and vetch, the legume, cover crops. You can see that 40 is a good average guess. You saw those figures we had, a couple, those nice little histograms we had before. Um, from the Spanish study, but you can see that upper end potential there. It gets really high, 100, 120 in some of those situations. Um, so is this enough nitrogen to justify the cost? That's the question. You know, you can get, let's say 40 pounds, maybe, maybe you'll get more. So I just took the current value of nitrogen is about 40 cents a pound. So what's the nitrogen value for 40? About 16 bucks an acre. 24 if you go with 60 pounds per acre. Um, you know, that, for a lot of cover crops, that's not going to cover the cost of the seed. Um, you add in the $10 per acre on the lost productivity, that all varies depending on a lot of other things. You kind of see the, the numbers aren't strong. These aren't a big uh, no-brainer for farmer adoption. That's why we see what we see. Here's the last one. We've seen some talks on this on using the cover crop as a forage crop. So this is some study. The poster is actually over here. Um, this is a study being done by Kevin Shelley in Nutrient Pest Management, Jamie West, um, I think you've seen the back there, and then Matt Ruark again. Um, they've been looking at using early season rye forage before you plant corn silage, um, or early season rye as a forage crop before you plant silage. Um, it affects the following of the, the, the quality and the quantity of the fallow crop, the corn silage. And what, what they have is a base system is no-till continuous corn um, silage. And then you, one of the systems afterwards is to just do a rye cover crop, and the other one is to do a rye cover crop that you actually harvest as forage. And so the green is the cover crop terminated um, with a herbicide, and the blue is the used as forage. Um, this is the net gain in, this would be extra revenue generated for milk because the quality, it's all quality adjusted for the forage and the quantity of forage is using the current milk prices in those years. And really, you can talk to Kevin about it um, afterwards. It's the extra milk after you've taken out some of these costs, the, 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 uh, the paying for the seed, the planting, the herbicide, the extra forage, you know, extra, an additional harvest. There's nutrients removed by the forage. Um, what I want you to see is relative to the base system, sometimes you, you come out ahead, sometimes you come out behind. On average, it's a winning bet, 59 bucks an acre and extra revenue from the milk or 233, but the blue one lost money in 2014. The green one, two out of the four years, it lost money. Um, there's also this um, interactions that go on, cover crop by crop, by environment, by management, interactions matter. Sometimes you're worse off with cover crops. I think we all know that. Um, cover crops use soil moisture, which is good in wet years and heavy soils, but it's bad in dry years and light soils. And a very good example is the 2012, we had a very dry year here, um, and then 2013 is a wet spring. This is just a graphic example. On the left is the um, 
yeah, on the left is the cover crop. I want to make sure it's the same as what you guys see. On, on the right is the no cover crop. This is a Columbia County example. Um, this is a picture in 629 um, from Matt Ruark, I believe. Um, the rye cover crop was harvested on May 10th. He planted the corn. Well, the rye cover crop um, was harvested. He had a soil moisture deficit. So the cover crop, you can just see it on the left side, is much lower um, in, in you know, plant height. It's a little more yellow than the, the, cover, the non-cover cropping section on the right side. Um, would this be the same if you had cover crops for 20 years, or maybe you had built, changed your organic matter content? Would it look the same? I don't know. We'd, you'd have to do the study. Um, now, I've done sort of those benefits, the you know, soil erosion value, um, nutrient nitrogen values, um, um, and then the, um, the, uh, some of these other, um, the, this potential um, additional forage. Let's just in, yield as the integrator. What do you see? This is back to that Spanish study. I would love to see someone do something like this in the U.S. Um, this is an example of, this is maize again, or corn following these cover crops over the five-year periods. Um, and this is just the yield. And that red vertical line um, in, in the middle, which I'm not seeing the cursor, um, is um, that's the zero. That means there's no yield impact. There's, that's the zero number. You can see it in the bottom, very bottom of the slides there. And this is all in metric units, um, yield of um, kilograms of yield dr of dry matter per hectare. The point I really want to make is I've converted the maize yield into bushels so we can think about it in the U.S. world. But the vats was up 13 and a half bushels. Um, barley was 5.3. The mean with the rapeseed is negative um, 3.5 bushels. And then the fallow is essentially zero, the average. But you can see the range. Sometimes you're lower, sometimes you're higher. That's what you get. Um, cover crops, um, sometimes you come out behind. That's the point I wanted to make there. And it depends on the, the, what the cover crop is. And over the five years, you get different outcomes. So um, what is the yield benefit of cover crops? I mean, that's what you think of yield as the integrator. This is a, Jason Bergtold is an ag economist at um, Alabama B. Auburn, Auburn University. He did a paper. It's in an ag econ journal. Did a survey of farmers, um, 300 Alabama farmers. 67% had used cover crops sometime in the last three years. 33% of the adopters perceived a benefit. The other 67 or 63 percent did not. Of those perceiving a benefit, how much was it? Almost 13 percent. I wasn't able to figure out what the average across all of them was or what the average of those who had negative benefits was. The real point I'm trying to make is that triangle, again, is meant to be just like the triangle we saw. Um, I'll go back a slide. Um, these triangles. It's just the same. Sometimes you come out ahead, sometimes you come out behind on, these, on the yield effect. Um, that's the point I'm trying to make. So you can do an analysis here. You can take the price of whatever your, of the harvest crop is, take it times the extra yield that you get when you get it, minus the extra cost. That's your net benefit. You can figure out some of these things with soil erosion and productivity and nutrients, et cetera. Um, and the real question is, is the yield increase on average enough to justify the cover crop um, in the terms of the spending on it? Is it enough to justify that risk? I, I think we, you have to get away from the fact this is not a, you spend the money and you get a certain payback. This is a risky payback. And so the farmer's taking on a different kind of risk when they do these cover crops. Is the cost savings enough to justify the yield risk? De it really, and when you start talking about that variability, you've seen those little slides. It depends on your costs. What, how much can it cost you to plant that cover crop? Then it really comes down to your willingness and capacity to bear risk. Everybody's got, we as economists argue, everyone is different on their willingness and, and capacity to bear risk. How much you discount the future. A lot of these benefits are coming further down the line. Some people want money right away. Some people are patient. A lot of times that depends on your age and or your financial status. Um, and then there's all these non-monetary benefits that cover crops generate. I feel better planting them. I'm doing something. I'm helping the downstream people. That, is, that does have value. And some people it has more value. To other people it has less value. So I think that statement in red is cover crops are not a sure bet. You're not always going to win with cover crops. The real question you should be asking yourself, are they a good bet for you? Um, and all the different management and stuff can slide that figure around down there at the bottom. The blue line is the benefit probability distribution. Certain things will slide it up, certain things will slide it down. Um, and, and then you have to ask yourself, do, what, do I want to take that bet? That's the way the farmers need to think about it. And I really think this underlies a ton of problems or issues in, in humanity. It's just There's this common issue underlies a lot of what we consider problems. You pay these big costs now, whatever they are, and you have to wait a long time for the benefits. Um, you invest in being healthy, and you don't really see the benefits to you much older. But it's a lot of work when you're younger. Um, um, 
I think of it, or you can flip it around. You can switch the cost of benefits around. There's this big benefit right now. I don't pay the cost for the future. You know, pick your favorite, you know, eating extra food, smoking or drinking too much, whatever. The benefit comes now. You don't pay the cost till later. That underlies, and cover crops very much are like that. You spend money now. The benefits come in the future. How long from now? You know, when's that, when do the benefits exceed the costs? How big are those benefits going to be compared to the costs? How much are those costs? That underlies a ton of things we spend a lot of time agonizing about as human beings. Then once you add that variability in these responses, the risk, it just becomes even more unclear. What the heck should I do? Um, are good or bad outcomes due to good luck or bad luck or to your choices you made? It's very hard to tell. You know, it, it, you can't tell. Was I lucky or was I, um, did I do a good job? So now I'm gonna switch to some data. Um, this is a survey of Wisconsin organic vegetable farmers. Um, Ginny Moore was the graduate student working on it. She's here somewhere. Um, it's in review currently. And really, I like this because we're gonna pick um, organic vegetable growers. They're sort of a group of good farmers. If they're, you know, they're organic farmers or they're supposed to, you know, held up as these are good people, they're, tr they're trying to do the right thing, et cetera. And they generally use cover crops. So let's look at them and see what we get here. So it's a 2014, 152 responses. You can see the size of the farm, some very small to very large operations. Most of them are 36 acres is the mean, the median is four. So a lot of these are pretty small. You can generate a lot of revenue off these vegetable um, cover cropping operations. Um, and there, you can see the median um, revenue um, was from the vegetable 78%. There's seven different vegetable crops as the middle group. Um, but the three top three vegetable crops are a big chunk of their um, acreage. They're, you know, they tended to have some specialization. It wasn't just a little bit of everything. Here's where they're from. You can, it's a little hard to see the colors. Well, actually, you can see them better up there. You know, you can see they're in the traditional organic areas, but they, it's a, there's a wide coverage around the state. 78% planted cover crops in 2013. 75% at least for part of the season. 61% for the full season. So they're using cover crops pretty intensely. This is way higher than you would see like in the conventional corn soybean operations. 14% had planted cover crops, just not that year we did the survey. Um, we did the survey, you know, roughly this time of year about their, what they had done the year before. Um, and on average, it's about 40% of their acres. So that seems pretty good. Um, here's what the, this, the horizontal axis is the year. And then this is the percent of respondents when they started planting cover crops. You can see we had some early bumps there. And then it was fairly flat from the mid 80s to the early 2000s. And then it really took off. Roughly that's when organic, the National Organic Program, finally the standard was set, and a lot of people joined the industry as well. The National Organic Program set what you needed to do if you're gonna um, be certified organic. So we, and the cover crops are a part of that. And this is a couple figures. Um, most of these growers are using cover crops in their organic vegetable acres. We've seen that. 78% um, planted that year in, in 2013. Um, roughly, you can see on the left side there, and I'm talking, looking at the top figure, the, the reddish one, Roughly a third of them, well, 40%, but roughly a third used them a little bit, you know, on 10% of their acres, some 10% or less of their acres. Then there's a third in the middle, somewhere between 20 and 90%. And then there's another third um, at the end there with pretty much our full adopters in all their acres. So one third, one third, one third. A one third used on a few, one third on some, and one third on most of their acres. But then you look at the bottom figure, it's their percent of their total acres that are um, using cover crops. And you can, what you can see there is um, it doesn't necessarily slop over to what they're doing elsewhere. The part of it is the, um, it's just, it's, it's a little different in these um, vegetable systems. You can, they're more intense. Um, what are they doing? It's a diverse portfolio, but rye dominates. I've kind of circled in red the main ones, rye, peas, oats, the clover, and buckwheat. Um, you can probably throw alfalfa in there, and then you've caught the big ones that they're using. Um, use every year, the lighter color is used in some of the years. But you can see rye is the big one, um, and then oats and other cereal. And then a lot of crops are using a lot of them. You can see there's some, you know, there's a number of respondents as the vertical axis horizontally. How many different cover cropping species did you plant? One to 12. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of people are using, people are using a lot of different species. So this is a part now we ask them, what challenges were the most important impediments um, or issues you saw with cover crops? You can, cost shows up a lot. You know, you got direct costs, you got managerial costs, or you got opportunity costs. These are the top six. Seed expense is the number one cost. That was what, what makes it hard to do cover crops? The seed. Extra time to manage. It takes me more time. Vegetable operations, these guys are work, they work a lot. It's a lot, it's a very intensive operation. It might only be three, four acres, but it's a lot of time. 
There's a short planning window. It's another management issue. I got to get it in there and I got to be sure that when the, man when the time is right, I got to get it planted. Management difficulty. There's an extra work again. Um, special equipment, a, a direct cost. I got to buy something to make it work or rent it or borrow it from a neighbor or something. And then there's the opportunity cost. I'm putting that cover crop in, rye or whatever it is. I'm not planting a vegetable I'm selling. That's what they see. Cost, cost, cost. So let's start pulling this all together and get back to this meta economics. So what is the meta economics of cover crops? Cost matters for cover crop adoption a lot. Um, cost share is and will continue to be an important driver for adoption. On the, I'm thinking on the grain systems, the NRCS, that is going to be important. Cost is a big deal. Um, even among farmers who believe in cover crops, the organic industry, cost is still a big issue to them. And um, so I expect with the tight margins out there this year, um, and even last year, somebody even more so this year, we're going to see some serious disadoption of cover cropping because it's just they're going to become very cost conscious, and we're going to see a pulling back on cover crops on, on, by grain farmers. Cover crops are risky. Um, they're not a sure bet, but they can be a good bet. That's what I'm hoping you, some of you see out of this. Sometimes the cover crop will make the farmer worse off in the, in the short run. Um, and are the good outcomes due to good luck or good practices? You really can't tell. Um, so I think we need some honest statements and assessments of the benefits and risks that, um, to, in order to manage farmer expectations and to maintain legitimacy and credibility of cover crops. You can't, be, think of, be, you can't get the farmers thinking you're selling snake oil. That's the way to think of it. Be realistic about it. Yeah, sometimes they are going to lose you money. Um, you have to be aware of that. that isn't, it's, it's not a sure bet. It can be a good bet if you... Um, or if you're, you know, a good manager and are willing to try, the, try it all. It's also an investment. Um, and investments have immediate costs and they're risky and uncertain long-term benefits. And you, you're not going to be guaranteed a payoff. Um, it's like a lot of things in life. Um, you find these, I think what we can do is find some of these long-term users to show these benefits where you can get to in the long term and hit some of the human element to inspire and maintain long-term investment by farmers. I've done this for a couple years. Now it comes 2016, the margins are tight. Hey, Billy Bob over here, Mary Jane over there, they've been doing this cover cropping thing for a long time and it still seems to work for them. You need a little inspiration or something to keep these people, keep the investment going so that eventually you get to that spot where the benefits exceed the costs, whenever that is, if it ever happens. Um, here's the point I really want to make is cover crops are very idiosyncratic, very focused on the, what each individual operation um, and they're also very diverse. Success depends on the specifics of each farmer, um, each farm, each field, each year. You've seen some of that already in what the, the, the people doing real science with the real collecting real data show you. It's very diverse. It's just too diverse to come up with a simple rule or design a research program that's going to answer all the questions. A one-size-fits-all rule will always be second best. You can't because each farm is so different, each year is so different, each um, field is so different. And there's just too many research questions to answer. So um, that's my first big bullet there is farmers are going to need to do their own research to figure out what works for them on their farm, on their fields, is what I would add there. Um, it's, there's just, we don't have the resources to spend on it. And frankly, the benefits aren't big enough to justify a billion dollar research investment in figuring all the different ways we can use cover crops on farms. It's just, there's just so many op options. It's so diverse. What species? There's, you've seen so many different species. You can see um, the, the grazing, you know, all those species that went up. Each one of those can potentially behave differently in these, on a different field. How do you do research and all that? You, it, we don't have the resources to do it. The timings can change. The management practices can change. Um, so I'm, you know, you want, each farmer is going to have to find a low cost, simple and locally relevant practice that works on their fields. And nobody else can do it for them. They can, we can give them as extension and outreach and research, we can give them some ideas, but they're gonna have to do some of that themselves. Um, there's just no way around that. Um, and then on the policy side, I'm thinking like for NRCS, um, these rules should be as flexible as they can be. I mean, we're gonna have to have rules. There's no way around it. We have to have rules, but try to make them flexible so that they can be, each grower can figure out a way to make them work for their farm. Um, widespread and highly intense adoption, intense adoption is unlikely. I, I have a hard time seeing that happening, like I'm thinking corn and soybeans, not without some, um, some rules. You think what you see in the organic vegetables there, I put that um, greenish figure again, even though they're using a lot of cover crops on their vegetables, it doesn't necessarily lop over to their other acres. Um, 
Cover crops that almost have to become a requirement. You need something, uh, it becomes not a economic thing, it becomes a political solution. There's a rule set that, ha that has, you know, a legal solution. Um, the National Organic Program is really driven organic, some of the organic um, vegetable growers into it. Conservation compliance, you make, make that required, maybe cover crops become required. In the European Union, the common agricultural policy has a cover cropping requirement. Um, and so that is what, we're, if you want widespread, highly intense adoption, it's not gonna happen voluntarily, even with a lot of cost share, it's probably gonna take a rule. Um, think of what um, Tom Casper's talking about, what's happening on the, um, in, in Iowa with the, the nitrogen. It, it might be a lawsuit. If it comes out where the farmers, have, they might have to do something like that. It's not a, it's a political solution. It's not an economic or voluntary solution. Um, institutions matter. We talked a little bit about the crop insurance rules. That, that's a big deal. Rental arrangements. Um, there's a lot of people who are absentee landowners. You know, there's a lot of land rented. Um, and some of them, or a big chunk of them, are, are interested in these issues. We could, uh, why can't we find example leases that require cover cropping? We could do it. Of course, then the, the rent is gonna be different because you're forcing the farmer, whoever rents that land, to do something. Well, you can't expect to pay the full market price for that rent. You get, all right, I'll pay, I will pay 10% or you know, $15 an acre, whatever that number is, lower rent, but I will do the cover cropping. Um, we can find examples of that. So thanks for your attention, and I guess questions for everybody at the end, I think, what we're doing. <laughs>